Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Praise the Lord. Are you guys ready to study the Bible? Amen? All right. Well, welcome to the Chronicles of Prophecy again. Uh, instead of doing our normal Sabbath school time, we are going to be studying uh, the United States in Bible prophecy. That is our topic here. So um, how many of you have been coming out to the series each and every single night that we've been doing the evangelistic series? Okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. We hope those of you online have been joining it as well. Uh, we're very excited about the series because we are getting to learn more about Bible prophecy and be better prepared for Jesus Christ's soon return. And so, friends, this is what this is all about. So thank you so much for coming and joining us here this morning as we worship God and as we study His Word to get to know Him better. So uh, before we dive into the Word this morning, what should we do? We should pray. So let's go to God in prayer now. Let's ask Jesus to be with us. Father in heaven, we want to say thank you, Lord, so much. Lord, for waking us up on this beautiful morning, on your morning, Lord, and giving us life. We ask, God, that you will please continue to be with us, leading guide us, Lord, into all truth. As we come here this morning, Lord, to study your word and specifically to study Bible prophecy and the United States of America in Bible prophecy. Lord, please give us understanding to this subject. Help us, Lord, to not look to our own ideologies, but to look to your word and, and its fulfill it. Fulfillment, rather, Lord, in our lives. I pray, God, that as we study this subject, that you will help us to take this word and apply it to our lives. That we will not just be hearers, but that we will be doers of your word. We thank you, we love you, and we ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're, we are studying the USA in Bible prophecy. In the book of Revelation, you read about a lot of different things that are going on. There's lots of different prophetic, symbolic things that are going on. The book of Revelation cannot be read in a literal format or you will not understand it. You have to be able to take the book of Revelation and you have to be able to take the symbols that God has given through different beasts and through different, uh, through different images and you have to be able to look them up in the other parts of the Bible to be able to give them the proper understanding. And uh, so and when, you, when you study the book of Revelation, specifically Revelation chapter 13, you read about these two beasts that are, are coming up and, and becoming a problem in the last days. And these two beasts are actually going to be ushering in what the Bible refers to as the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is probably one of the most climactic, one of the most serious, probably the most serious warning in the book of Revelation. It is, the, it is that whoever accepts the mark of the beast should be killed or, or uh, put to death in the lake of fire. And whoever does not accept the mark of the beast should be persecuted, perhaps even unto death, at the hand of the beast. And so there is this, there is this definitely this, this dichotomy between, uh, this controversy rather, between uh, good and evil that's ushered up all the way into the very last days that we are living in today. And the book of Revelation paints this out very beautifully as it, as it goes through and describes these two beasts that are coming to power. Now, before we can understand Revelation chapter 13, we have to first identify what beasts represent in Bible prophecy. So let's ask the question here, what do beasts represent in Bible prophecy. Now, should we go to our own minds or our own understanding and try to think what we think it might be, or should we let the Bible interpret itself? Amen. We have to let the Bible interpret itself. Beloved, listen to me. There's so many people in Christianity and in Christendom today that are misunderstanding the Bible in so many applications because they are trying to apply their own interpretation to Scripture. In fact, the Word of God tells us that no Scripture is of private interpretation. We cannot apply what we think, what we feel, or what we believe. We have to let the Word of God interpret itself. Is that clear, everyone? Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's ask the Bible, what do beasts represent in Bible prophecy? Well, the Word of God tells us in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Now, we've talked about how the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation is definitely connected. And we've already showed that in our evangelistic series so far. But we read here in verse 23 of Daniel, chapter 7. It says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom. And so we see here in the Scripture that beasts in Bible prophecy represent what? Kingdoms. Kingdoms. These would be nations or countries. And so we have in Revelation chapter 13, these two beasts that come together and form a type of an alliance to, to usher in the mark of the beast, the last day deception, and the power, the, the, the ultimate power that has deceived and has even gave the power to these beasts is the devil himself. 
to try to usher in his final deception in the last days before Jesus Christ comes back. So friends, we have to be on our toes here. We need to be studying Bible prophecy because it's important to know about the cross. It's important to know about what Jesus has done for you. That's right. None of the things in prophecy is going to matter if you don't know Jesus. Can we say amen? It'll just be a bunch of information to you, and it won't mean anything to you. You need to know Jesus. However, you also there's an important reason why God has given us prophecy so that we will know what is coming in the future and so that we will be prepared for it. Can we say amen? And so we need to be ready. So as we dive through this study, we are going to see that the Word of God gives us exact details as to what would happen. Now, this first beast that's rising up in Revelation chapter 13, this is, the, this is the biblical description of this beast. The Bible says it's rising up out of the sea, rising up out of the sands of the sea. It has seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns, ten crowns. And, and uh, it says that it has the body of a leopard, the face of a lion, and the feet of a bear. Now, friends, that's a very ferocious beast, isn't it? That's the type of beast I wouldn't want to run, to, run into out in, in the wild. Now, is this talking about a literal beast that would come out of the sea in the last days? Or is this a sim symbolic imagery that Jesus is using? This is symbolic, no, no doubt about it. And so we're not supposed to expect some type of lion-like, bear-like, leopard-like beast with seven heads and ten horns come out of the literal sea, out of the literal ocean someday. But this is symbolic. So we need to be able to identify what beast represent in Bible prophecy. Have we done that? Yes, yeah, so what would this beast symbolize? It would symbolize a what? A kingdom or a nation that would rise up in the Bible. And so we see here in Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, we read about this beast and it says this. John is in vision on the island of Patmos and he says this. I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. John was in vision. Jesus was giving him these, or these, uh, th these uh, visions about the last days and he would later give us, all throughout the whole Bible, the interpretation of the vision. And so we see here, he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Notice, and upon his heads, the name of what? Blasphemy. Now I have a question. So far what we studied earlier in the book of Daniel, is this beast very similar or, or have some... Um, uh, some synonymous views with another beast that we saw before. Absolutely. What beast was that? It was the beast, the fourth beast, in Daniel chapter 7, which was the kingdom of what? Rome. It, remember, it was the feet of iron. It was the fourth, the iron-like beast that we see here on our banner that would represent the kingdom of Rome that was reigning in Jesus' day. And so... It gives us details that are, very, that are very much connected to the beast in Daniel chapter 7, which would have been the kingdom of Rome. But notice it gives us more details and expounds more upon this. And it says here, it has seven heads and it has ten horns. Now, did the beast in Daniel chapter 7 have ten horns? Do this right here. Yes, it had ten horns, no doubt about it. And so we see that there's a connection. Okay, that beast had ten horns, this beast has ten horns. And then notice what it says here. It gives it another identification. It says that upon his heads was the name of what? Blasphemy. Now, have we talked about blasphemy so far in our series? Absolutely. Blasphemy in the Bible, a lot of people want to say that it's just disrespect towards God. Well, that's more of a man-made definition of blasphemy. A biblical definition of blasphemy is not just disrespect towards God, but taking on the prerogatives which belong to God alone in the form of Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Remember, Jesus forgave the paralytic of his sins. Remember that? And when Jesus forgave the man of his sins, he also told him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And the scribes and the Pharisees sat around and they said, Oh, who can forgive sins but God alone? They said, He is guilty of blasphemy. This man commits blasphemy because he was claiming to have the power to forgive sins. Because we know, biblically, only God can wipe our slate clean in heaven and put our name in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't that right? Amen? So, so they saw that Jesus was taking on a prerogative which belongs to God alone in the form of uh, forgiving sins. But was Jesus God? Oh, absolutely, in the fullest sense. And we're, we're going to learn more about that today as we look through that. But nevertheless, we see that Jesus was God, so he was taking all the prerogatives of God. The Bible says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So it's very beautiful to see how Jesus was God incarnate. He was God in the flesh. Now what's amazing about this is that it goes on to say here that 
that uh, he, this beast commits blasphemy. Now, another definition of blasphemy is not only claiming to have the power to forgive sins, but claiming to be God on earth. And we get this from John chapter 10 and verse 33. Remember, Jesus, um, Jesus basically told them in John chapter 8 and onward, he had this dialogue with the scribes and the Pharisees, and he told them, hey, listen, Abraham wished to saw my day, and he saw it. And they said, Abraham saw your day? And they said, Jesus, you're not even 50 years old yet. You mean to tell us that you spoke to Abraham, our father? And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. How many of you remember reading that in the Bible? Right? Before Abraham was, I am. So what was he calling himself? Jesus was calling himself the I am, the self-existent one of the Old Testament. Amen? The one who gave Moses uh, the, the, the tablets of stone, the tablets of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And so... That is another form of blasphemy, when you claim to be God on earth. So in John chapter 10, verse 33, we see the Jews say, Who could, you know, hey, this man speaks blasphemy because he be, him being a man makes himself God. Are you with me, friends? So again, that is the two definitions of blasphemy according to the word of God. So this beast power, now again, this is a beast, so it means this is an entire nation that is committing blasphemy, claiming to have the power to forgive sins, and claiming to also be God on earth. Claiming to take the place of God. Have we already identified this first beast according to the Bible in our former presentations? Absolutely. We've already identified it. But we'll, we'll talk about it in just a minute. Let's finish reading the text though. In Revelation 17, 15 it says this, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So what does the sea or the waters symbolize? Nations, people, multitudes, and tongues, right? This is a, a highly populated area. So if the sea or the waters symbolize a highly populated area, then this nation that is a blasphemous nation that's taking on the prerogatives that belong to God alone would be rising up out of the sea, which means this nation rose up out of a highly populated area. Can we all say amen to that? Okay, so we're getting this straight from the Bible. I'm not making this up. We're letting the Bible interpret itself. So we have this ferocious, leopard-like, lion-like, bear-like of a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Unlike any other beast that you would have ever heard described before, this is a very ferocious beast. And friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that this beast is the Roman Papal Church State. Now, we've already studied this. You may be new here this morning, or you may be watching this online for the very first time. But we've already studied this in the past, and we've showed 20 identifications as to why the Roman Papal Church State meets the identifications as the Antichrist power and as the beast of Revelation chapter 13, the first beast rising up out of the sea. Now, this is the same beast that God warns us about that has a mark. That has a what? A mark, and we call that the mark of the beast, right? Now, what I find in, in a lot of Christian churches and a lot of Christian circles, a lot of people are trying to identify what the mark of the beast is. And there's all kinds of theories and all kinds of ideologies out there. And people saying, well, I believe it's a barcode. And some people say, well, I believe it's a computer chip. And you got some people out there saying they believe it's websites. And some people out there believe it's just one singular man. And there's all kinds of different ideas out there uh, for, for different uh, interpretations as to what the mark of the beast is. However, I think we make a grave mistake when we try to identify the mark of the beast when we haven't yet even identified the beast. Can you say amen? It makes no sense to, for someone to try to say, Oh, I know what the mark of the beast is, when they haven't even first identified who the beast is. Amen? If you want to know what the mark of the beast is, it only makes sense that you learn first who the beast is so that you'll know what their mark looks like. Can you say amen? And so, friends, we have already identified that this beast power is the Roman papal church state. Now, if you miss those 20 identifications, I encourage you to go online. You can go back and watch the Antichrist Unmasked, my presentations. You can find them on YouTube, or you can go to the church website and find them there on the church website. The Antichrist Unmasked and Mystery Babylon, you can go back and watch all of, uh, both of those presentations, and that will give you the identifications there. Moving on, though. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, it says this, And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, 
and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Now, another thing that a lot of people do, again, is that they try to apply their own interpretation to Bible prophecy, specifically in Revelation, which is why a lot of people just... The, the, the Bible doesn't make sense to them in Revelation when they study it. A lot of people will see the dragon, and they'll think, Oh, China! Right? Because, let's face it, right? China uses the dragon a lot, almost like their, their mascot. Okay? And so, a lot of people are applying the dragon and different things to be interpreted as China. Friends, it's not China. The Bible tells us that the dragon is the devil, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. We read this in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. The Bible identifies itself and explains itself, so we don't have to do, play a guessing game here. So it says that the dragon, that would be the devil, gave him, that would be the papacy, his power, his seat, and great authority. Now, if you've been coming to our presentations, you know exactly why the papacy fits the biblical description. Because they literally meet every single one of those 20 identifications perfectly. The timeline and everything. So it's amazing. But in Revelation 13, verse 5, we read, we read this. It says, And there was given unto him, speaking about the beast, the, the papacy, a mouth speaking what kind of things? Great things and blasphemies. Now, what's amazing here is that when you study in Daniel chapter 7, when you study about Rome, you read how Rome transfers from pagan Rome into what, what we understand to be papal Rome, which was the papacy. Are you with me? And so you read about that transition in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, dealing with the little horn power, the Antichrist power, which is synonymous with the papacy. And in Daniel chapter 7 and in Daniel chapter 8, it says that this little horn power, which is the papacy, would speak great words against God. We read in Daniel 7, 25, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws. Are you with me, friends? So, we have to understand here that this power is one in the same. The papacy would represent also the beast power, and that, that that transition from pagan Rome into papal Rome would also be synonymous there with the beast in Daniel 7. And so, when you read about this beast, it says here, it says, And power was given unto him, unto the papacy, to continue forty and two months. Forty-two months. Now, in order for us to identify the time period that this is, we cannot think literally, again, because we're studying Bible prophecy. This book is given in symbolism. We have to think uh, we have to let the Bible interpret itself, and we have to think in, in symbolism of Bible prophetic terms. And what we have here, we have 42 prophetic months. Now, in the Bible, there was 30 days in a month. How many days in a month? 30 days in a month. So check this out. You do simple math. This beast power would rule for 42 prophetic months. So you do 42, multiply by 30. That's how many days was in a biblical month. And what do you get? 1,260 prophetic days which would translate to literal years. And how do we know that? Because Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 tells us, God says, I have appointed to you each day for a year. So when you're dealing with Bible prophecy, it's like the understood one in algebra. It's a rule that when you're dealing with Bible prophecy, a day would be equivalent to a year. So we're not talking about 1,260 literal days. You're talking about 1,260 prophetic days, which would be equivalent to a literal year. So, this beast power, the papacy, was prophesied by the Bible to rule for 1,260 years before they would receive a deadly wound. Before they would receive a what? A deadly wound. Now, are you ready to see this? This is amazing. Check this out. When you look up in history, when the papacy actually became supreme, in other words, when they became the head of the church as well as the state, that's when you see church and state amalgamating what we studied in Daniel chapter 2 with the feet and the clay uh, mixed together, the iron and the clay trying to mix together. And we know iron and clay doesn't mix, just as church and state amalgamation does not mix. So what happened in 538 AD, the papacy became the head of the church as well as the state, and the papacy was calling the shots. The church was telling everyone else in the society and in the world what to do and how to live. Are you with me? Now, should that happen? Do this right here, because some of you look confused. No. 
It should not happen. If the church starts to tell everyone how to live, how to do things, and if you don't listen to them, what happens? You die. Is that freedom of religion? No. And is that what the papacy did after 538 AD? Absolutely, friends. Church and state amalgamated. And so you look, look, look it up. Have you ever heard of the Dark Ages? The Dark Ages started in 538 AD. As soon as the papacy came into power, they started ripping the Bibles out of the people's hands. They wanted to be the sole interpreter of Scripture. And they started to persecute God's people. And they said, if you don't follow our canon laws, and you don't do what we want you to do as the church, we will kill you. And that's exactly what happened, friends. Over an estimated, the history books record, you can look this up in the encyclopedia, the history books record an estimated of 50 million to 100 million people lost their lives during the Dark Ages. That's a lot of people, amen? That's a lot of people. And so and it was at the hand of the Catholic Church that was leading and the head of the church as well as the head of the state. And so they came into supremacy in 538 A.D. when they became the head of the church and the state. Now, you count 1,260 years later. If we did our math correctly, we should see the papacy receive a deadly wound. Now, notice a deadly wound is just that. It's a deadly wound, right? Uh huh. Now, if you receive a deadly wound, are you dead? No, because it's a wound. Right? Now, if you receive a deadly wound that's a near-death experience, you're not going to heal overnight, are you? It's going to take some time for you to heal. But after much time, you're eventually going to start regaining your power back, right? Regaining your energy back. Regaining your momentum back. And that's exactly what's happening right now as we speak. It was in 1798 A.D. that Napoleon Bonaparte... How many of you remember reading about Napoleon Bonaparte? Right there at the end of the 1,260-year time period, after 538 A.D., Napoleon Bonaparte told General Berthier, his general, to go and dethrone the papacy. Napoleon Bonaparte's general was historically said to have uh, tied the, the pope up by, by a rope and drag him back to France and throw him into prison where the pope later died in prison. After this happened... All of the rest of the countries and the rest of the nations did not recognize the papacy as a nation or as a statehood anymore. Are you with me? Now, I got a question. Is the papacy a nation? Yes. When did they gain back? So in 1798 AD, that deadly wound was given to them by the hand of Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1798 AD, that was a deadly wound. But what year did the papacy regain back their statehood again? It was 1929. You can actually read and look up and Google a New York Times post, 1929, dealing with the deadly wound healed. You will actually find a 1929 New York Times post that talks about how Mussolini, how many of you remember reading about Mussolini in history? Uh huh. Mussolini actually gives back and recognizes the papacy as a statehood once more and gives them back and acknowledges them that again. And when he did that, that started the healing of their deadly wound that was given to them by the hand of Napoleon Bonaparte. And so ever since then, you see the papacy has gained ground tremendously, not just in America. Not, Roman Catholicism hasn't just gained ground just in America. It's gained ground in almost every country that exists today. And so this is the 1,260 years, the 42 prophetic months that the Bible prophesied that the papacy would rule. Now, friends, that's amazing. God's word is true. Can we say amen to that? God said they would rule for 1,260 years in supremacy, and that's exactly what happened. But notice what the Bible goes on to say here. Revelation 13, verse 3. He says, And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was what? Healed. Now, notice what happened right after the wound is healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. All the world did what? Are you seeing the world wonder today? Friends, think about it. Everywhere I go, I, I, you know, I tell people, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a minister. They say, oh, well, what do you do? I say, I'm an evangelist. I preach Bible prophecy seminars. And they go, oh, really? Well, what do you talk about? And I say, oh, the Antichrist. The Antichrist? They said, well, who do you believe it is? I say, how much time you got? It might take a little, little bit. And so uh, people are wondering. 
They don't know who it is. You go and ask your average church or your average person that attends a Sunday morning service or, or, or a prayer meeting or anywhere you go. Most people don't really know. They'll say, oh, we don't really know who it is, but we know they're coming. A lot of people don't even know that the Antichrist power has been here for a very long time. All they have to do is read 1 John chapter 2. John said that the Antichrist is coming, by which we know is the last hour. And then he goes right after that and says... Even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. Amen? And so, friends, the word of God is very clear. So all the world is wondering after the beast, even now. We're living in that time of wonder. But, friends, praise God, you don't have to wonder anymore. Amen? You can know the truth for yourself. Revelation 13, 4, notice what it says. And they worship the dragon, that would be the devil, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying... Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So are you seeing how the people now have, have been deceived into actually worshiping the devil and the beast themselves? Are you with me? Did you know right now there's over one billion Catholics in the world today? Now I want to be very clear. Do we hate Catholic people? No, we don't hate Catholic people. And I want to be very clear here as well. God is not at war with Catholics. Amen? He's not at war with Catholics. Does Jesus love Catholics? Did Jesus die for Catholics? Absolutely. We're not talking about people. We're talking about an institution. Can we say amen? That meets the biblical description. So we're talking about not Catholics, but we're talking about Catholicism. Remember, Catholicism is not Christianity. It's its own ism. Remember we talked about you got Buddhism, Hinduism, and then come on, you got Catholicism. It's its own belief system, and they don't follow the Bible. They follow the catechism. Are you with me? And so all of this is, the terminology I know can be a little play, a play on words, but nevertheless, it's very true. Now, are there very well-meaning, good Christian, so, good Catholic people out there that love the Lord and are doing all that they can to live up to the Lord and, and His Word? Absolutely. I have many good Catholic friends who's doing all that they can to follow the Lord and they're searching and they're trying to know as much truth as they can. They just don't know what you have been learning in this prophecy series so far. Amen? But hey, God will lead and guide them. Amen? And He's called us to lead and guide them to the truth as well, to, to, to help them to see the truth for themselves. And so notice what we see here. They worship the dragon, and they give, uh, which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, that would be the papacy, saying... Who is alike unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? You know what you're starting to see now? All of the nations are going to the papacy for peace and unity agendas. And pay attention to the news, my friends. All of the world countries are going to the papacy for peace agendas and unity agendas under the banner of the ecumenical movement which is headed out by the papacy themselves. The devil is looking for people to join his system rather than join the Bible and join Jesus. Are you with me? Can we sacrifice our, our, uh, our truth and our message and sacrifice the truth in the Bible just to join under unity? Absolutely not. And sadly, sadly to say, that's what a lot of people are doing today. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here in the Scripture that's very amazing is that they say they boast... Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Oh, I love this. You know why I love this? Because this is highly prophetic. Because when you go to Daniel chapter 12, you read about when the time of trouble would happen, right when the time of trouble comes on God's people. You read about an angel, a messenger of God, and his name is Michael. His name is what? Michael. Do you know what the word Michael means? Not archangel. He is the archangel. He is the chief of the angels. But you know what the word Michael means? The word Michael means who is like God. Oh, come on, man. I can't be the only one getting excited right now. Who is like God? Right? And so you have the beast boasting, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And then right there in Daniel chapter 12, Michael stands up and he says, who is like God? Who is able to make war with me? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it because Bible prophecy is so real. So right when you see God's people about to be taken over in the book of Revelation, right when you see the time of trouble coming upon them, and it seems like there's no hope, 
Michael stands up and says, Who is like God? Who is able to make war with me? Amen? That's powerful. That's powerful. So in Revelation 13 and 6, we we read on and it says this. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his what? Tabernacle. Oh, my friends, I wish I had the time to share with you how the papacy has cast down God's sanctuary, his tabernacle. I don't have the time in this presentation. But if you want to see it and you want to know it, you got to come to me afterwards. Maybe maybe this afternoon sometime I can take you through and share with you some pointers. So friends, this is amazing prophecy here. It says, And them that dwell in heaven. So, So the papacy is blaspheming God's name. They're taking on and blaspheming God's name. They are blaspheming His tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven. Now friends, it's amazing because in Daniel chapter 8, you read about how the little horn power would cast down God's sanctuary truth to the ground and trample upon it. Man, I'm about to start preaching something else. i got to be careful. Come to me afterwards if you want to know. It's amazing. It'll blow your mind. It says, And it was given unto him, given unto the papacy, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, who are the saints? That's God's people. Those that are obedient to the Bible, those that are obedient to God's Word. So it was given to them to make war with the saints and to overcome them. How did that happen? It was during the Dark Ages that the papacy overcome God's people and, and that they, they, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, open your Bibles with me real quick to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to come up, we're going to come back to this in just a moment in our study. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and let's look, let's begin reading in verse... Verse 13. It says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? The woman represents the church in Bible prophecy. The woman here is the pure church in Revelation chapter 12. That's God's pure people. So the dragon, the devil, in verse 9, it says, uh, it's calling the dragon and the devil in verse 9, is persecuting the woman. That would be the church. And it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Interesting. What is the USA's mascot? Eagle. Isn't that interesting? It says here, and there, was, there were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time's time and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And it says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Now the water that was cast out of the serpent's mouth, out of the devil's mouth, that represents the flood, that's persecution. You say, Dakota, how do you know that? Well, remember in, in Matthew chapter uh, 7 when Jesus was talking about the Sermon on the Mount? He said... They that hear these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came. The what came? The floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. Because why? It was found on a rock. The water, the flood, would represent persecution against God's people. So Jesus was warning the floods will come. But if your house is built upon a rock, it will fall not. And then he warns them. And they that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, the disobedient, I will liken him unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it, Jesus says. Amen? And so we want to make sure that we're founded upon the rock. Well, the early church was founded upon the rock and that rock was Jesus Christ and his word. And so they did not fall. Although the, the, although the persecution of the papacy was heavy upon them, they did not fall. Instead, it goes on to say, oh, I put my Bible away. Instead, it goes on to say in Revelation chapter 12, we're in chapter 12. Turn back there real quick. Revelation chapter 12, notice what it says here. Verse 15. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth helped the woman. The earth helped the what? The woman. Who's the woman? The true church, God's people. The earth helped the woman, it says. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. 
What does the earth symbolize? Stick with me. We're going to get there in just a moment. It tells us. Now, check this out. Revelation 13 and 7. It says here that they were given power to make war with the saints, to overcome them. That was the dark ages. And power was given him over all the kindreds, tongues, and nations. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So now there's the deception. All the people start to worship this beast and give homage to this beast and pay him tribute. And these are people whose names are not in the book of life, the Bible says. Now look at verse 9. It says, If any man have an ear, let him what? Hear. How many of you have ears this morning? I hope you're going to use them this morning because you're going to need them. Because this is highly prophetic and we need to know this for ourselves. So it says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Verse 11. And I beheld another what? Beast coming up out of the earth. Coming up out of the what? Where was the first beast coming up out of? The sea. Where's the second beast coming up out of? The earth. Are you with me? What does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? A nation or a kingdom. Friends, this nation, this kingdom that was coming up out of the earth is none other than the United States of America. Now think about this for a minute. During the time period of the 1700s, there was, during the time period of the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s, there was a lot of people in Europe. There was almost, almost all of the world's population was primarily in Europe. And so that's where all of the, the persecution took place by the hand of the papacy. What happened around the 1500s and 1600s? What happened? The Protestant Reformation. Are you with me? So, the people began to protest against the papacy. That's why we call ourselves Protestants. They protested against the papacy and said, no, they're not following the Bible. We cannot continue on believing this. So they began to reform the Protestant Reformation. They began to reform away from the papacy and its teachings and beliefs because they were not founded in the Bible. And so what did we do? Because we protesting because we were formed the papacy was going to do exactly what they had been doing for 1200 years they were going to say oh you don't want to follow us you don't want to follow our canon laws well, we're going to put you to death too almost all of the men that translated our bibles that we have here in english almost every single one of the men Wycliffe, huss jerome all these men who played a significant role in getting the word of god to all of us so that we can have it today so that we can come here in congregations today and worship the lord those men lost their lives by the hand of the church to get you the Bible. How much do you cherish it? They cherished the Word of God so much, my friends. They gave their lives for it. We have probably 17 of them laying around our house collecting dust. Isn't that truth? It's that one app that we barely ever use on our phone. We are to be ashamed of ourselves. We live in a great country where we have the Word of God at our fingertips. You can go to Dollar Tree and get the entire King James Bible for a dollar. I bought one of them. I can tell you. So we have no excuse. When Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds of heaven and we find ourselves not knowing Him, we have no excuse. Almost everybody has those little cell phones nowadays. You can download the Bible for free. You just got to read it, friends. So I encourage you, spend time in it, and you will find beautiful things in God's Word and be better prepared for His soon return. So this beast that's rising up out of the earth represents the United States of America. Now, most of the world was highly populated, right? But was the United States of America highly, highly populated at that time? No. Now, there was some populace here, but they were little barbaric tribes of the, of the uh, Native Americans, and they were different tribes, and, and they, they lived all throughout the U.S., but they were not a highly populated area compared to Europe. Now, check this out. So let's look at seven identifications of the lamb-like beast here given to us in the book of Revelation chapter 13. Number one, it arises to power around 1798. How do we know that? Because just as, just as John was seeing the beast power receive a deadly wound, the first beast, the papacy, as soon as they received a deadly wound, what year did that happen? 1798. Right after that, you see another beast coming up out of the earth. And so we know that sometime around the 1700s, we should see another major nation that's going to play a major role in the last days coming to power around the 1700s. 
Do we have one? It was July 2nd, 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was formed and put together. It was July 4th of 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was signed and ratified. You have 1787, the Constitution was formed and put together. In 1788, the Constitution was signed and ratified. Were we coming together as a country? Yes. And then you have here, the Bill of Rights in 1789 was formed and put together. In 1791, the Bill of Rights was signed and ratified. Now here's what's amazing. Now we're in the 1790s and our country has become an amazing country. Right around the same time, that the first beast, the papacy, receives that deadly wound. Isn't that amazing? We were the only major power coming to power around that time. So the papacy arose from the sea, symbolizing people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. In Revelation 17, 15, we read about what the sea symbolizes. It symbolizes people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. So, if the second beast would represent the United States, the Bible says that the second beast came up, not from the sea, but from the what? Earth the earth would represent a sparsely populated area. It had some populace there, yes, but it wasn't highly populated like the sea was. Moving on, moving on here. So it arises in a sparsely populated area, and it was because of the Protestant Reformation. When we was reforming from the papacy in Europe, our pilgrim forefathers, when they came to this country, and they landed in Plymouth Rock in 1620, when we came to this country, we were not trying to conquer another power. We were trying to escape religious persecution. Can someone say amen to that? We were trying to get away from the religious persecution. So that brings us to our next identification. That the United States of America doesn't conquer another, notice, world power in its rise. Notice I put world power. The reason why I put this, a lot of people try to say, well, we conquered the, the Native American tribes. We, we, we did conquer another world power. Well, the Native American tribes, friends, those were tribes that were independent of themselves, they were not one big nation. There were tribes that were independent, their own little small uh, tribes that were dispersed throughout the United States. And here's the deal. Many of our pilgrim forefathers, when we came and landed in this country, landed in Plymouth Rock in 1620, we had no idea that there was even, many of us had no idea that there was even another uh, type of people here. We heard about a new land. And so we were ready to, to go and escape the religious persecution. We were not trying to conquer another world power. Can someone say amen? Amen. In fact, so we don't conquer another world power. How many of you know what the Statue of Liberty represents? It represents what? Liberty, freedom, right? So it's called the Statue of Liberty. Did you know what's written on the Statue of Liberty? Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Notice what the, it, this is like the anthem, Lady Liberty is what we call it, right? This is her message. This is our nation's message. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these homeless tempests tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. We were not trying to conquer another nation. What were we doing? We were welcoming people. We were welcoming people. We were saying, hey, listen, are you being persecuted? Are you being picked on by other people because of your faith, because of the way you like to live your life, because of your job, whatever it is? Hey, listen, come to us. Send those homeless tempests tossed to me, we said. We lift up our lamp beside the golden door. Amen? That's powerful, beloved. And so we were not trying to conquer another world power. Now, what's amazing is our country started off on the right foot, right? And then how many of you have seen the United States of America change dramatically just in your lifetime. Oh, boy, oh boy. Some of you folks that are more experienced can definitely tell us a lot more about that, can't you? You can see the United States of America morph into a totally different country than what we used to be. And so friends, don't get me wrong, I'm patriotic, I love this country, but I hate what it's starting to become. We have changed so much. We are not the same country we used to be. We are changing so much, and I fear for this country, and I know what the Bible says about this country. So we were not, again, opposed to, uh, 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 or we're not trying to conquer another world power. Rather, we were welcoming people. Slavery, cr pride, cruelty, uh, inequality, all of these things started to creep in because the devil saw another nation rising to power, 
And he had to try to plant his anti-social, anti-Christian maxims into the veins of the people early on. And did he do that? Yes, he did. Civil War and many other things started to happen to try to tear this country apart. Moving on. This is a young nation. Is the United States of America a very young nation? Yes, we are. We're very young compared to the other nations that existed for thousands of years. We see here in Revelation 13, verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. That term coming up there is the same term used in the Greek to describe a flower in their growth. We are a very young nation. We haven't been around too long. Moving on. Our point number five. There is no crowns and no kingly authority on this beast, on the second beast in Revelation 13, on the United States. The first beast has crowns. Crowns would indicate kingly authority. There are no crowns on the horns of the second beast. Do we have a king that rules over us? No. What do we have? We have a president that is put together and established under a democratic thought process of a republic to, dis to establish security based under the, uh, the law that has been put together by the people for the people. Can we say amen? This is what we have, and this is what we're supposed to have in America. Let me say that. But that's changing. It says, there are no crowns on the horns of the second beast. Now, this beast was described to have two horns like a what? Lamb. Very interesting that the Bible would use that concept. Two horns like a lamb. Almost everywhere in the Bible, where do we see a lamb being represented as? Jesus. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the two horns like a lamb would point out some of these uh, characteristics here. In some way, this nation, the United States of America, would have Christ-like characteristics. Now, when we started out as a nation, what are we starting out on the right foot primarily? We, we established the right laws. We established freedom and liberty. We had freedom of religion, freedom of speech. You go down the list. We established the right concepts to have a free society that we can live and enjoy today. But something happened. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So this nation started out on the right foot. What did we put on our money? In God we trust. It's a, 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 a beast that has two horns like a lamb. Some way our... Our system of would have the political principles of Christianity, which brings me to my next point. We would have the political principles of Christianity, one of those being absolute freedom. Here's the thing, my friends. Here's the thing. Our country, one of the greatest things that we have is freedom. It's one of the greatest things we have. Could you imagine if you were raised in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and be under those, those systems of, uh, and those ideologies that makes you a slave to whoever is older than you. Oh, my friends, we are so blessed to be born in this country. We need to thank God every day for allowing us to be born in this country. Or if you wasn't born here, hey, praise God for allowing God to be able to make you come here. Amen? It's a blessed country, no doubt about it. But freedom is starting to dwindle. Freedom is starting to dwindle. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. How influential is this beast? How influential is the United States of America? There's an old saying, it says, if the United States sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. It's true, my friends. Everything the U.S. does, the whole world follows right behind. Revelation 13 and 12, notice what it says. This is how influential this beast is. And causes, speaking of the second beast, the United States, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first what? The first beast. Who's the first beast? The lion-like, bear-like, leopard-like beast that we read, the papacy, in the same chapter. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was what? Healed. So you mean to tell me, Dakota, that the Bible is saying that our nation would start to cause the whole earth to worship the papacy and their laws and their rules and their means. Absolutely. That's what the Bible's saying here. Absolutely. Check this out. Let's move on here. Number seven. Our last identification. It becomes a global power. A global power. Now you say, how do, how do you know that, Dakota? Look at the, what the Bible says here. First of all, we are the United States of America. We are a very amazing country. 
we have grown tremendously over the last couple of hundred years that we've been uh, existing. And notice what it says in Revelation 13 and 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a what? A dragon. Spoke like a dragon. So we started out, we had two horns like a lamb. We started off with the kind of the political principles of Christianity, but then we started morphing and we started to speak like a dragon. Now who, according to the Bible, is the dragon? The devil! Satan himself! And so friends, has our nation started to speak like a dragon? Let me ask you a question. How does a nation speak? A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body. If you want to know something about a nation, look at its laws and look at its legislative body. Look at what's trying to be passed. Look at what's being enforced. Oh, my friends, things are changing. Time is changing. I never thought I would see the day in my life. I never thought I would see the day. Learning as a child about our nation and our laws and our rights, growing up learning that in our Constitution, I never thought I would see the day that a woman would be put in prison because she exercises her religious freedom to not marry a couple that is of the same sex. How many of you remember when that happened a few years ago? That's unconstitutional. It was unconstitutional. Why do you think all those people were outside protesting, holding signs, saying, free her? It's unconstitutional. But our nation is changing. We are starting to be more like the first beast. In other words, you got an opinion? Well, we're going to call that hate speech, which is a crime nowadays, and I'm going to put you in prison. You want to say something on Facebook? Facebook's not going to allow you to say that. Why? Well, because they want to categorize that as, in their definition, hate speech. So you're starting to have no more freedom of speech. You got a YouTube video you want to share to warn the world about the coming Antichrist power? Well, guess what? They're going to censor you. You can't say that because it's hate speech. Are you seeing how our country has changed? Freedom is being ripped from us little by little to where we don't really know that much about it. And then eventually we'll create a tolerance for it. Like, well, you know, that's just the, that's the days we live in. Nobody bats an eye. Nobody says anything. Nobody protests. Are you with me, friends? Our country's changing. You know, it's a sad thing that if someone comes to me and they say, Dakota, we want you to marry us. And I say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that because that violates my religious freedom to do so. I can't do that. That, that violates my moral conscience. And I love you guys. I wish you the best. But I don't agree with that. I love you. I just don't agree with what you're doing. And they say, oh. and they can go turn me in and try to get me in trouble. And then I will actually have to show up to court. That shouldn't even happen in our country. Shouldn't even happen. If I was, in a, if I was a judge in a situation, I heard about something like that, I would be like, they're not even coming in my courtroom. I'd be like, Judge Judy, no. It's not happening. Nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body, friends. We're seeing our country change right before our eyes. Revelation 13 and 12 says, And he exercises all the authority of the first beast. Speaking of the United States, exercises all the authority of the first beast, notice, in his what? Presence. Have we been seeing Catholicism, the papacy, and the United States of America start to have a close relationship over the years? Uh-huh. And it's happened so quickly. How many of you remember when JFK was president? Our, were, our, our countrymen almost lost their minds because JFK was a Roman Catholic. How many of you remember that? They said, oh, we can't have a Roman Catholic in the office because we got to keep church and state from separating, or from coming together, rather. we got to keep the, the separation of church and state. We can't be having a Roman Catholic in office. Interesting. Look at today. Do you know that six out of the nine men and women that are on the Supreme Court are Roman Catholic? One of them is a practicing Jesuit, trained in Jesuit school. It's crazy, friends. 
we are living in the last days. You know, we oftentimes get mad at our presidents, and we try to blame our presidents for everything, and our presidents kind of come the fall man. Let me tell you something here. I'm not here to talk politics this morning, but I do want to make a point. I don't care this morning if you're Democrat or Republican. It makes me no difference. I don't care if you're Republican or Demublican. <laughs> it makes me no difference this morning. But I, I do want to say this, is that the president oftentimes takes the fall for everything, but any bill that's passed that goes into actual uh, authority in this country, the last people that have the last say is the Supreme Court. So if we want to get mad at someone, we shouldn't be getting mad at the president. He's just one man. Get mad at the committee of nine people that sit on the Supreme Court. The whole thing that was passed back in 2015, the, the gay marriage thing, a lot of people were upset about that. They thought that was wrong. Look who passed it. Supreme Court. That tells me about their fruit. What about you? Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Revelation 13 and 12 says, And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That the United States of America and that the papacy would come together in an alliance and they would cause the earth and everyone who dwells in it to worship the papacy whose deadly wound was healed. It's amazing, friends. Has there been an alliance over the years? You tell me. You have Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Obama. All of them having private meetings and private talks with the pontiff. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. I can think of at least 4,000 for these. What about you? Look at this picture here. This is John Paul II's funeral. There is three live presidents at his funeral. You have two Bushes and a Clinton. Are you with me? That speaks volumes, my friends. That shows me that there is a close alliance and that there is a respect for Roman Catholicism in this country, in this nation's hierarchy. And it's getting stronger and stronger as we go along. You don't see the popes coming over here, all the popes that are alive. You don't see the popes coming over here when one of our dead presidents died. Being at their funeral. Don't see it. This shows a, a hierarchy and a superiority. That the pontiff is more superior than even the United States president. Interesting. Right here on Rolling Stone magazine and Time magazine, they refer to Pope Francis as the people's pope. Rolling Stone Magazine says, The times, they are a-changing. Pope Francis waving. Let me tell you something, friends. They are changing. And this man here, Mario Jorge Bergoglio, is making sure that the times are changing a lot quicker. I don't know this man's heart, but I do know the Bible calls the leader of this system the man of sin and the son of perdition. I didn't call him that. The Bible does in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, there's a reason for why the Bible calls him that. Are you with me? This man knows what he's doing. And he's acting very quickly to do it. To get, to get an ecumenical system of unity together. To say, hey, you know what? Jesus wanted us to all come together. You lay aside your religious differences and we'll lay aside our religious differences and we'll just come together on the banner of unity under the banner of the papacy. That's what's happening, my friends. 2015, we invited Pope Francis to come and speak to the most powerful men and women in the United States of America, the United States Congress. What does that tell us? Is there something happening? Better believe it. There's something happening. And when Pope Francis came and talked to the United States of America, when he came and addressed the United States Congress, he talked about peace and unity agendas of how we all need to come together under the same banner. Lay aside our differences. You know, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul warned us about this false peace agenda that would come. He said, Brethren, you have no need that I should speak. He said, No, brethren, you, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. He says, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as the labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Paul warned us about this peace that would try to come together. 
They, she said, they shall say peace and safety, and then sudden destruction will come upon them. He said, and they shall not escape. This false peace unity agenda, friends, under the banner of the papacy, is not of God. It's of the devil. It's of the devil. We, we actually brought him through the exact formation that we would bring our new president in an inaugurational speech where he addressed the United States of America. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Look it up. Here's the current president, Donald J. Trump, meeting with Pope Francis. Private talks, several of them now. What are they talking about? What are they planning on? Well, the Bible tells us exactly what would happen. They are setting up the stage, my friends. Whether you like Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, doesn't matter. The Bible is very clear that they would put together a mark and they would enforce that mark upon every man and woman and that whoever accepts that mark, whoever accepts that mark of the beast should be destroyed in the lake of fire. Friends, I don't want any one of you to be destroyed in the lake of fire. I don't, certainly don't want to be destroyed myself in the lake of fire. Can we say amen? So we need to take this message seriously and give our lives to Jesus now and get ready now because Jesus is coming soon. The times of probation are soon to close. Moving on, Revelation 13 and 14 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast... So he's doing what? Miracles in the sight of the beast. The papacy is going to work miracles in the last days, it says. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Make an image to the who? Which beast? The papacy. Which had a wound by a sword and did live. You know what the image to the beast is? Let me tell you. The one thing that set apart the papacy and them being a statehood and them being a nation that made them, unlike any other nation, the one political principle that set them apart was that they had church and state amalgamation. And so, the image to the beast that we're trying to form and that we will eventually form is laying aside our religious liberty to, chort, to form church and state amalgamation. Friends, we are told in Bible prophecy that all of these things will start to happen in the last days. All of these judgments of God would start to fall. And then the people would look unto them and say, these people over here that obey God's commandments are the reason why these things are happening. Because they are not honoring us and obeying us. They're rebelling against us. So God's judging them. And a hatred and a form of persecution will come upon this planet like never before. The time of trouble will be up on this planet like never before. And it is then that Michael will stand up. And while they've been proclaiming, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? God will stand up and say, who is like me? Who is able to make war with me? Oh, friends, God will save us. Amen? Amidst all of this trouble, amidst all these problems, God will save us. Revelation 13, 15, it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Anyone who would be opposed to this church and state amalgamation, anyone who would be opposed to this forcing, this religious observance of the papacy upon the nation would be put to death. Not only have we formed a religious and political image to the beast, we have formed a literal image to the beast. What do you see? You see the Vatican, and you see what? Washington. Friends, the Bible speaks clearly on these things. Revelation 13 and 2, what does it say? And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. There's a reason why God gives us this description about the papacy. You want me to tell you what it is? Because each and every single one of these animals has a very distinct characteristic that makes it very destructive. What's the one thing you don't want a bear to do to you if you run into a bear? To claw you. Because have you seen a bear's claws? I go to the zoo every once in a while with my wife when the weather's good, and we go and we love looking at the grizzly bears. They're so amazing and so massive. And I love looking at those claws. Those claws are longer than my entire hand when they're stretched out. That's insane. One swipe can take a man 
completely out. Mighty creatures. Then you have the, the mouth of a lion. Interesting. Can you think of any more mouth that more ferocious than a lion? Very few can even match it. Then you have the body of a leopard. I got a question, my friends. How does a leopard hunt its prey? A leopard doesn't. Cheetahs do. Cheetahs use speed. Leopards don't. You see, a leopard, my friends, it blends into its environment. And it sneaks on the ground and crawls really, really slow. And it gets as close to its prey as it possibly can. And then right before the prey doesn't even have a clue about it. It jumps and pounces. And once it pounces, and it digs those ferocious claws into its prey and puts its weight down upon it, what is it going to go for? What does a lion's mouth go for when it kills its prey? The jugular. What kind of, oh man, what kind of beast do lions hunt? Think about it, friends. Do they hunt the strongest buffalo, the strongest beast, the strongest of the gazelle, the strongest of the wildebeest? The young. The what? The young. Friends, my friends, we are the youngest nation. We are a very young nation. And there is an old beast that has been around for a millennium and more. And that has much experience in destroying nations. And they are creeping over. And they are getting their sights set in and they're getting their mouth ready for the pounce. And our country has no clue. Most of the people in this country have no clue. We have to be ready for this pounce. Can you say amen? We have to be ready. We have to get our hearts and our minds ready, especially. Revelation 13, 16, and 17 says, And he causes all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free, and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their what? Or in their foreheads. It says, That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Interesting. You may be saying, Dakota, how could this happen in a land of freedom? How could our country, free country, be changed so quickly into what it is today? How could this happen? How is this going to happen? You say, Dakota, what is the mark of the papacy? What is the mark of the beast? Well, friends, guess what? You have to come tonight at 5.30 for the mark of the beast part one to find out. How many of you are ready to find out? Praise God. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring your enemies, bring everybody. Because they need to hear this message. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for your love. God, we know that this nation has changed much, tremendously over the years. But God, we know that you never change. Your word stands forever. Your promises are sure. And so, God, we thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom and knowledge as we go forward, Lord, learning, having learned what we have learned here tonight, I pray that you will give us knowledge and wisdom as we go forward. Help us, God, to know your truth more and more and to apply it to our lives, that we will not just be hearers, but that we will be doers. God, we know the time is short and, and our redemption draweth nigh. Help us to keep our eyes on your son, Jesus, that we will not become distracted by all of the wiles of the devil but that we will proclaim your everlasting gospel message to the world so that they will be ready too. That is our prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.